Well, South Africa's finest Ms. Ntlanta Nene came out and spoke, but did he conquer the hearts and minds of citizens, business leaders, and the greater investment community? This is tonight. I'm a croaky Bruce Whitfield because I smoked nine cigars before the show while I could still afford them. Tonight, we find out if the minister's budget symphony hit the right notes. And to answer this question, I'm joined by Busi Kumalo, who's the president of the South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Also, associate professor of economics at Wits University, Christopher Malikane. Ferdi Schneider, who's the national head of tax at BDO, South Africa and Gerard Soverall, the head of indirect tax at PwC South Africa. Gentlemen, we play a little game. Uh, you give the budget a score out of 10. You tell me within a minute whether you liked it or you didn't and why. Chris, you go first. Uh, the score is 4 out of 10. Okay. Uh, I didn't like it. Um, I think the budget uh, has got some inconsistencies. Uh, firstly, if you read uh, the budget speech, he says that uh, everyone ending above a certain threshold is going to get a 1% point tax increase. When I calculated those numbers in the speech, they were not summing up to 1%. Secondly, the stuff that he said in October about ESCOM, that they are going to have private-public partnerships, they are going to offer some equity stakes, private equity stakes, and that basically they are going to approach the private sector by selling non-core assets, certain non-core assets. These things are not in the budget speech now. Um, secondly, transparency. I'm not sure where the money is going to come from. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you where it's going to come from. <laughs> it's coming from an 80 cents a litre price, petrol price increase. That'll add 17 billion plus 1% on the tax bill. That'll add a little bit. But yeah, he's increasing the national budget. He's increasing spending by nearly 8%. That's a concern. This is far from an austerity <coughs> budget at all. Uh, Vusi Kamala, from the business perspective, yeah. your members must be thrilled with this budget, not, I guess. Thrilled, I'm not too sure. Okay. What's but your score first? My score is six. Okay. Uh, I think I say the score is six, basically because um, this budget speech was cognizant of um, the difficulties businesses faced with, especially on the electricity challenges and small, medium enterprises. That was particularly interesting because it was encouraging. But he could have gone so much further on small business, could he not? I mean, uh, their, their tax allowances for th up to 350,000 rand turnover, you don't have to pay tax and register mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Up to a million, there are fewer further, uh, there are further sort of lessening of demands from the National Treasury. But these are micro enterprises. These are survivalist businesses. Mm -hmm. These aren't the businesses that are going to create the jobs we need to get the consumption growing to grow the economy. We see that, that, that's the thing that worries me about it. I think it's quite interesting that uh, he singled out in his speech the small medium enterprises, basically because of the difficulties that they're having in terms of uh, getting the right prices and also look going through all the red tapes that they have to the, go The best thing that came out of it was the 30-day plan. Now, mm -hmm. Jacob Zuma, the president, has been sitting mm -hmm. on every podium I've ever been to where he's been speaking, mm -hmm. saying, we're going to get payment to 30 days. This is the first time I've actually believed it is in the budget speech. Gerard, that's positive. Um, mm -hmm. Out of 10, what's the score? Uh, maybe I'm um, out of sync here, but I think uh, seven and a half. Um, uh, there were a lot Can of somebody take his temperature, please? <laughs> 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 As I said, maybe I'm out of sync. Um, I want to look on the bright side of things. I think uh, lots of good intent, lots of composed, confident uh, commentary. Uh, he's touched on some key issues in the economy, social welfare, welfare um, uh, safety and security, the energy crisis, infrastructure, education was a really big issue which was talked about today. I think SMMEs have got a, uh, certainly more of a, of a look in, in the speech today in terms of funding. I mean, the thing for me with SMMEs, I know some of them might be called uh, micro-enterprises, but what they really need is they need funding, they need to get paid on time, yep. they need access to opportunities. Uh, and it was great to hear some of these things mentioned today um, in the budget speeches, uh, um, let's say issues which the government intends to act on. So that would be my, my view. Why I took half, percentage, half a point off the score was uh, I'm not happy about the rise in personal income tax. I think in the end it's counterproductive to, to tax um, a small proportion of the citizenry, let's say uh, the larger proportion of the tax. Uh, that in the end it doesn't bode well. Yeah. well. What he's doing is robbing Peter to pay Paul. So he's <coughs> taking, he's taking extra tax from people who earn over one and a half yeah. million rand a year. They'll be paying 1,100 rand a month more in tax. And he's kind of shifting that to people who earn less than 450,000 rand a year, spreading um, the benefit lower down the, down the chain. That's a noble gesture, is it not? 
Uh, look, on the face of it, yes, but the, the tend to be that the people who earn more and pay the large proportion of taxes are the entrepreneurs, uh, the kind of senior business people, the middle management, who actually tend to spend more in, in real terms, um, uh, in terms of hard cash than mm. the poorer people. My personal view is um, I think there should have been an increase in VAT. But, but that was the proposal that was put through yeah. mm -hmm. um, by uh, the Davis Tax Committee. They said put up VAT. Yeah. But it's just a pol politically unpalatable, I guess, Ferdy, uh, for the finance minister <coughs> to do that. Um, he did say to me this evening when I spoke to him earlier, I, say, I said to him, why did you not do it? He said it's on the table, it's under discussion. Mm -hmm. We could see a nudge up in that next year, possibly. Everyone was expecting it, it just didn't happen. You'll score out of 10? Six and a half. And the you guys with halves. <laughs> the accountants, you give them, a, you give them an opportunity to chuck a half in. Let's make it 6.75. Oh, wow. Um, okay, good. Let, let's go for 6.75. And, and the reason why I'm deducting points here is I think there's not a, enough curtailing of the expenditure. I think the expenditure is way too high and it's running out of proportion at the moment. I think our GDP growth is still a problem. I think on the tax side, I do agree with Gerard, the, the hike in the personal income tax with 1% that actually adds about 1.4% if you actually do the calcs at a million rand per annum. Um, and, and that's perhaps, Chris, the, the, the difference between the 1 and the 1.4. The 1 is the marginal rate and the yeah. other one is the effective rate. Um, the fact that they didn't t touch on, on VAT, I think, is a pity. But I think there may be a quid pro quo in the future that there may be some give and take. That yeah. is a very regressive tax, so um, it is a political hot potato. So six and a half, uh, six point seven five rather. Yeah, I'll stick with. Okay, adding to the electricity levy, uh, it's a tiny mm. amount of money, and it's promised that it'll be temporary. Let's watch that one ever come down yeah. again. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the fuel levy. That's got to be the big story out of this budget. Yeah. That affects absolutely everybody. It's a bit like raising that, isn't it? It is almost yeah. exactly like raising that. It's a consumption tax. It's a consumption tax. And, and I've always been under the impression, and it seems now to have been wrong, is that it was actually brought in to be equalization in nature, to, to curb uh, fluctuations. And now we're using it almost as a revenue tool, which mm. I find strange. Yeah, okay. I mean, it, 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 it was Baron Duplessis who initially took the road taxes during the P.W. Boerter era and said, okay, that's for roads. No, we need to fight a war in Angola. We'll put it over there. Um, yeah. and, and it's sort of stuck like that ever since. Um, when we look at the, 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 the positives of this budget, the social net, of course, is widened. Mm -hmm. That is good. We have an incredible poverty issue. We don't have jobs around the corner. There is an added burden uh, on the fiscus to keep South Africans from abject poverty. Mm -hmm. Chris, that's got to be positive. Yes, but you see, the problem is that all these budgets, starting from Trevor Manuel, uh, Pravin Kodam, and now Ntlantanen, uh, they are the same, fundamentally. The frameworks are the same, because the structural processes that generate the poverty in the, in the economy is the same. Yeah. So the issue here is, what, what is coming out is that the, these budgets are failing to lay out a clear framework on how to really radically transform the South African economy to, to alleviate the problems that we What face. would you have liked to see him do today? For an example, uh, one of the pillars that the president spoke about is, is value addition to raw minerals. Nothing was said but about But everybody's that. been saying that for the last 15 years. That we is talk about it, we never do anything. Exactly, that is exactly what I'm saying. Mm. That this was an opportunity for him to elaborate on how that is going to happen. We know that there's something yes. about the mineral uh, uh, Petroleum Development Act, but the, min the minister has not clarified exactly what's going to happen. Even when it comes to I industrial policy action plan, it has always been there. But the problem is that industries are not growing, and you hear that industries are struggling with access to steel, import parity pricing yeah. with steel. Yeah, so those are the issues that the minister was supposed to deal with in order to, to begin disturbing the processes that generate poverty. Uh, and I suppose we see one of the great tragedies of this budget is it's not an expansionary budget. It's a budget designed mm -hmm. to appease ratings agencies. Nothing wrong with that. We've got mm -hmm. to make sure that we keep the ratings agencies <coughs> on our backs and not pushing us over the edge of a cliff. Um, and that's, I suppose, where the constraint came from. He couldn't push for growth without antagonizing uh, the ratings agencies, take on more debt, for example. I think it's quite correct, but more, more to that, one believes that the, the budget itself was, um, with its fiscal policy, was a positive. That will also further you know, allay the fears that the investors have in terms of uh, South Africa being the destination for investment. 
But does anybody want to invest in an environment with 2% growth? We, we, um, we already that's the trouble, you see. We already have investment yes. there, and yes. all that we need to do is to enhance that and further call for more investment. So in that regard, whatever fears that, I ha that the investors have about South Africa, they are now going to be allayed mm. and built from what is already there. Yeah, I mean, money, you, you don't pull money into an economy. Money comes into an economy, it flows into an economy when the environment is right for that investment and ripe for that investment. Gerald, what would you like to have seen him do differently? Look, I think uh, if I just talk about the investment for a second, briefly, sure. that's okay. I, I mean, doing a bit of research for the program this evening, you realize that there is an awful lot of foreign investment coming into South Africa. Maybe not as much as you'd like to see. But some, I mean, IBM announced 700 million uh, rand investment the other day. We've got call centers in Durban being set up. You've got the smart city in Modafontein. There's 84 billion rand over the next 10, 15 years. So it's not like investors are shy. Yeah. So the question for me is, what can we do to in encourage more investment? Yeah. Uh, and to me, it is about political stability. It's about social stability. And uh, the fact that Previn Gordon has now moved to look after the municipalities and how they work together so we can start uh, um, dealing with these issues of, of social unrest and, uh, and uh, delivery protests. And just give critical. people some sense of hope in the future. Well, you, you've got to stabilize, as you say, people's um, um, stake in the future. Otherwise, that stability does not come. And that's what I think harms the um, foreign direct investment um, to a great degree. Ferdy, what would you have liked to have seen? What would have taken you from a, a 6.75, you can't give them 10, to a 9 in this budget? <laughs> if, two things. I think if there was re less reliance actually placed on the fuel levy, First of all, and, and more reliance placed on the VAT system. If, if he raised VAT by 1%, he would have probably covered about 15 billion in additional revenues, with, um, uh, we, which actually in total now they covered 16.8 billion. So that, that's definitely uh, the, the two things that I think Why we does could it have make done a difference? differently. Well, I, I think it makes a difference. It's not inflationary, firstly, on, on the VAT system, because mm. it washes out the next year. Uh, the, the fuel levy per se, I, th I think dedicated taxes is a dangerous thing and I think you need to research that very carefully because as you mentioned earlier, um, and I don't know whether it was while we were alive, alive on the show or not, but um, the, the, the challenge is always to really de dedicate those taxes. Yeah. And with that everything goes in the pool, there's an audit, clear audit trail and we can actually manage it. Mm. OK, good points being made this evening. We have to pause. We'll take a break. We'll see you shortly. We'll talk about some of the benefits of the, the budget today, also some of the issues being raised in Budget 2015 and Tantanene's first budget speech of his term as Finance Minister. <laughs> This is Tonight Live. I'm Bruce Whitfield with my guests, Ferdy Schneider, National Head of Tax at BDO South Africa, Gerard Soverall, Head of Indirect Tax at PwC South Africa, Busi Kamalo, President of SACI and Associate Professor of Economics at Wits University, Christopher Malikane. Uh, Gerard Soverall, drivers of growth. Um, the, the Finance Minister maintains this is a growth budget. Uh, how is it a growth budget when you're taking money out of big spenders' pockets to put it into poorer spenders' pockets, um, and there isn't a single lever in here um, to really aid industrialization, the natural evolution of business. I think um, I don't think the money is all coming from the big spenders' pockets. I think there's an element of borrowing on the markets, which uh, we talked about uh, the, the issue of. Um, of downgrading and what impact that has on our ability to borrow at yeah. competitive rates. So there's a, there's a there's an issue there in terms of um, um, the amount of money available and the competitive rates that we that we borrow it at. But the point for me is that it's not all coming from the populace. Yeah. Um, but but it does ultimately though because mm. we're going to have an, we, it's going to cost us 150 billion rand a month to service government debt well, yes. and that excludes parasitical debt, yeah. which is ultimately government debt as well. Yeah. There's an element of of of, of servicing that, and I fully agree with you. But for me. Um, what, what drives um, growth in any economy are issues of the standard of education of your people, yep. uh, the infrastructure, which is telecommunications as well as, well as road and rail, um, and what we can do to engender a kind of productivity culture in, in South Africa. Because one of the big problems we're facing is the number of strikes that we, that we encounter on an annual basis. And it seems to me like when the strike season comes, people just accept 
it's a strike season, never mind. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the wrong attitude completely. Yeah. Uh, and there needs to be a lot of work done to, to turn that, that culture uh, into much more productive culture for the country. At the moment, a lot of the good work that's done seems to me to be dissipated because it goes up in, you know, in smoke, in a sense, when, when the strikes start. Of course, I mean, it's this back to basics idea that we need to go back to square one and say, yeah. guys, we're in this together. We either go down on this, ship, this great, great ship Titanic or we dodge the icebergs. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we seem hell-bent on aiming at the icebergs. I think uh, there's a positive out of that in that uh, the very, the very um, back to basic uh, program that the Department of Cooperative uh, Governance and Traditional Affairs is putting in place if properly implemented, it will reduce the level of strikes and protests simply because it will, I, I, the program itself will enable people to be efficient and productive. So in that way, it's a process, it's an educational process so that needs to be inculcated. Because fa let's face it, the federal of the matter is the issues. Mm, absolutely. And Make those issues can and will be addressed if properly implemented those strikes yeah. and protests will be reduced. Uh, Chris, you see young people every single day of your life who are at various levels of literacy, various levels of numeracy. Um, I don't know how long you've been in academia, but I mean, what is your assessment of the state of the nation's um, educational system? Well, uh, currently I can say that a lot of young people are being wasted. And the reason why they're being China. wasted is because the, the infrastructure for po post-schooling education is not in place. And that, that, that sector has not been well resourced over the past 20 years, despite these many good budgets that people mm. are talking about. And now we are facing a crisis where even the National Students' Financial Aid Scheme is running short of money. On the other hand, even if these students finish, there's no guarantee that they're going to get jobs because state-owned mm. enterprises are now running not on a developmental basis, but on a profit-making basis. So there's a lot of restructuring of the state that needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, th there's a big debate there as to whether or not there should be developmental or profit making. There's yeah. a lot of pressure on SAA um, to become more, pro well, to lose less money, let's not say profit making. Um, <laughs> ESCOM um, to produce electricity at a rate we can afford a kilowatt hour so we can have one of these lights on in future. Yeah. And when we, we look at it, Ferdinand, state owned enterprises are absolutely pivotal to government strategy in terms of driving the developmental economy agenda. But it's the thing that Busi pointed out earlier, we just don't have those public-private partnerships that everybody talks about and nobody actually does anything about. No, that's exactly. I, I mean, if you look at, at, at SAA at the moment, I think they probably accounted for a loss of two and a half billion yeah, rand, if I recall, 2.4 2 if I recall. And, uh, and Eskom in itself is a huge drain on the economy at, at, the, at the moment for various reasons. And, and the one, it's actually the one that you pointed out, is the lights going off the yeah. whole time. And uh, SA Post Office as well, um, uh, that's huge issues at the moment in our economy and that's three of the, the pivotal state-owned enterprises. And then we've got the, the financial institutions that we fund as well, the IDCs, yeah. the uh, African banks, those guys as well. I mean, that's a lot of money that we're spending there at the moment. Okay. Jer we, 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 uh, the budget is what it is. Oh. It is written down, the finance minister's published a big fat book like this. Mm. This is government spending plan yeah. as we go in. Where are the pitfalls that we need to be wary of? I, I think, uh, like all, all plans, the issue is execution. Yeah. And unfortunately, we've got a mixed record over the last 20 years in terms of execution. I mean, I know maybe the, the kind of flavor of the month these days is to have a moan about no, Sona and all the other yeah. strange things that have happened in the last. Uh, but that's few sort of that, that, that that's uh, an icing on a cake of well, of, of real concern. No, my, the but I was going to kind of put in in place there was if you do look around the country, there's an awful lot of building happening, a lot awful, awful lot actually going on despite the conditions. Yeah. All right. So what that tells us is there are plenty of people in this country with the ability and capacity to execute. So the issue is how do we get those people? into the right position to do that. I think one of the drawbacks of any political system, and this one's no different, is that politicians are ideologues, and they, they believe that what they're saying is right, when, when the facts sometimes stare them in the face and tell them the opposite answer. Yeah. So the question for me is how do we get the politicians to allow the best people at executing to execute. That's not necessarily the private sector, by the way. No. Not at all. That's just about getting right people in Absolutely. municipalities into yeah, state enterprises. Political, 
political sure. creed. To me, that's completely irrelevant. Yeah. You know, we have a big job to do in South Africa, and we need the best people to do it, well, and we have them. Do you have optimism on that front, Pussy? I mean, you were talking about it earlier. Do we have the skills, we have people, we could bring people in. Homecoming Revolution is doing a lot of good work in encouraging yeah. skills back to the country. Mm -hmm. We could do it if we flicked an ideological switch. I think that's quite accurate. For me, the concern that uh, I have against that is the fact that uh, there's an introduction of a new department, the Department of, um, um, of Justice that is going to be established at a huge cost. Yeah. And for me, that's the cost that uh, is uh, concerning because I believe that uh, if um, they look at um, what the structures are, some of the functions that are accorded to the cost can be distributed amongst uh, the functions that are currently in place. Chris Malikani, if you dare, give me a sense of optimism out of this budget from your perspective, and we will wrap it up. Well, my view is that as long as the minister is not going to cut heavily a government spending, because if it does that, it's going to cut demand, and it might even work against expanding the tax base mm -hmm. of the economy. So you must maintain a very careful stance of not just being radical in cutting the deficit. There we go. My thanks to my panel this evening. Thank you so much for coming in, taking time out late in the evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've extracted some value from our discussion this evening. From Associate Professor of Economics at Wits University, Chris Malakane, Busi Kumalo, the President of SACI, Gerard Soberall, Head of Indirect Tax at PwC, and Ferdi Schneider, National Head of Tax at BDO South Africa. Thank you for watching our budget post-mortem. There'll be more tonight, tomorrow. For now, good night.